Tom Clark's 6M Podcast is a Boink Studios production. And now, on with the show. Hey, hey, what is up? Welcome to Tom Clark's 6M Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Clark. And in this episode, I'm joined by co-host Phil Lindsay. It's the Halloween episode, kids. I know what you're thinking. This isn't a Halloween movie. What are we doing? This isn't horror. This isn't blood. This isn't creepy little demon kids. This isn't, you know, ghost nuns and, you know, other possessed entities or entities possessing people. However that works. Look, it's my show. And I don't do horror, okay? I've made that abundantly clear in the past. I don't like it. I don't like being scared. I don't like putting weird images in my head. If you want to call me a big baby, I don't care. It's not polite to name call. But if you have to do that to feel better about yourself, I guess I'll just be your punching bag. Call me what you want. I don't do horror. It's not my thing. But I'll tell you this. As we started in the past several episodes, right? We did the Blade Trilogy. And I'm like, this has kind of got a Halloween vibe to it, right? And then we had something picked out for this episode that you're listening to here today, episode 213, to be exact. And I'm like, wait a minute. By the time this thing's released, it'll be the week of Halloween. So why don't we just make it more Halloween themed? And my co-host suggested Ghost Rider, because we kind of joked about it during the Blade recordings. And I said yes, because I am a Nick Cage guy. And I love him. It's the only reason I said yes. But I'll tell you this. I don't have fond memories of watching this movie. However, watching it back today, and I was prepared, buddy, let me tell you. But guess what? I don't have a lot of terrible stuff for you. Right? Like, Blade Trinity, I had a whole bunch of terrible stuff for you. It's not a good movie, in my opinion. And the director of this here movie? Oh, man. I can't wait to talk about this guy, because yikes. All right? But this movie in particular, if I can be honest, not as bad as I thought it was. And now I can't quite remember why I thought it was, but we'll get there. Hey, man. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Hey, (laughs) you couldn't help yourself, could you? See, this was your idea because you're like, hey, man, Nick Cage. And you're right. Look, you're right. I never said you couldn't be right. You're right all the time. But still, I was hesitant. So I, I will I bow to your superior wisdom on this one, Phil, because you were right. Um, I actually went to the movie theater to see this movie, uh, believe it or not, oh. uh, when it first dropped. And I left it going, hey, that was kind of fun. And I didn't realize afterwards that a lot of people didn't like it. Now, I do recognize some of the things about it that are not very good. Mm. Uh, but there's so many things here that uh, just on the surface, and if you don't take these things that seriously, are very very entertaining and very and very funny. I mean, first of all, uh, this hair piece that Nick Cage is wearing for this thing to make him look younger. Wow, it's not working. A plus, man. A plus. <laughs> <laughs> Hell, if that's all it took, I would have got my own years ago. Are you kidding? <laughs> Pretty terrible. Look, as as Phil said, not not quite as bad as maybe some have made it out to be, but we can see why they have. And there's a lot to cover, but before we get there, let's do this. Ghost Rider is a 2007 American superhero film written and directed by Mark Steven Johnson. And yeah, baby, we're going to get to that. Based on the Marvel Comics character of the same name, it was produced by Columbia Pictures in association with Marvel Entertainment, Crystal Sky Pictures, and Relativity, Relativity Media, and distributed by Sony Pictures Releasing. That's a lot of companies on one movie. Yes. Film stars, as we know, Nicolas Cage as a title character with an assorted cast of actors around him to help lift this thing up. Really good cast, as we know. We've reviewed movies with really good cast before, like Blade Trinity, and that was a, a big pile of hot garbage, that movie. This one, not quite as rough. Again, depends on what your opinion is. Ghost Rider, created by the great Roy Thomas, Gary Friedrich, and Mike Plug. This movie produced by Avi Arad. If you are a Marvel fan of a certain age, you know that name. As well as Stephen Paul and Michael DeLuca. The budget for this movie 
with a running time of 110 minutes. By the way, kids, released, as we said, 2007, February 16th in the United States. The budget is $110 million. The box office is $228.7 million. So it did not make a ton of cash. In 2007, maybe it was enough to pay the bills, but the reviews are not great. We'll get there. But that is your lowdown for Ghost Rider. So, Phil, same opinion this time as the first time you saw it? Like, you still found it more entertaining than you found it to be problematic? Yeah, I, I think that it's it's still a guilty pleasure of mine. I still enjoy it for what it is. I don't think it's a great movie. Um, but as a fan, as a character, and just the visuals of the character, because I think one of the great things about Ghost Rider is he's he's got one of the most visually appealing character designs of any Marvel comic. Like, he immediately stands out. Incredibly dynamic design. And boy, does he look great on on screen here. I think that that's what I enjoy the most watching this movie um, every time I see it is that uh, Ghost Rider looks great in this thing. His bike looks great. A lot of the, the set pieces for it look great. Um, eh, some of the plot and stuff around it, eh, not so great, but we can't, we can't all be winners, man. It can't, well, yeah, I was going to say you can't all be winners. I can't disagree with you. Like, Visually, he's one of the more striking characters that I think that Marvel has ever done. Yes. Put me on the spot here. I'm trying to think, you know, you could always argue that Spider-Man is a visually striking character because of the classic red and blue, because of the acrobatic, especially the McFarlane art, where it was like bending his body and contorting beyond belief, you know, very striking visuals. But man, Ghost Rider as a whole, like, he don't look like a hero to me, Phil. Like... Like the Punisher, that that guy don't look like a hero to me, man. Yeah, and Marvel is just very good at uh, giving us those kind of characters. Then, I mean, there was a period where uh, when I was drawing often, I drew, I drew Ghost Rider a lot, and man, what a what a cool character, uh, just visually, man. And I think when you think about like some of the mythos around Ghost Rider, uh, some of it is uh, doesn't make a whole bunch of sense, but you know. It's comic books. And so I felt the same way watching this movie where it felt like, man, Nicolas Cage has been trying to get involved in a comic book movie for a very long time. We, of course, know about the failed Superman movie mm-hmm. and some of the other things. Uh, I mean, his name is based off of a comic book character. Uh, sorry, guys, if you thought that's his real name, but his real name is not Nicolas Cage. Uh, yeah. But his, his, his uh, Hollywood name is based off of a comic book character. This guy likes the medium. He's wanted to be involved. And uh, seeing him ham it up and do a lot of silly stuff for this movie, it's just like, eh, just let Nicolas Cage have fun, man. <laughs> just let him have fun, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as Phil said, if you if you kids weren't aware, he's part of the Coppola family, as in Francis Ford Coppola. So yeah, Nick Cage comes from a a pretty famous family here, folks. You know, to his credit, Phil, don't know what happened behind the scenes, direct, you know, throughout his career. But at least in terms of his name, he wasn't leaning on his family and, you know, and like to get famous. Like, of course, as you said, he picked Luke Cage's name for his last name. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. So, uh, well, and also we've covered Nick Cage's stuff quite a bit here. We've done Con Air. We've done Face Off. And uh, we're doing this film here today. And let me tell you, man, this guy, this guy has had a career resurgence Thanks to End of the Spider-Verse. I mean, it has really... And as we speak, Phil, he's filming Spider-Man Noir. Did you ever think in your wildest dreams that Nick Cage would be playing a Spider-Man ever at any point in his life? Absolutely not. <laughs> it's crazy, man. I can't wait to see that, by the way. We're not how it's even going to... I can't wait to see... When I say costume, of course, as you know, it'll be the trench coat, and I'm guessing the suit and tie, like the the throwback you know, film noir characters and he'll have the mask on, but I can't wait to see him all decked out, man. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like a lot of fun. Um, you give Nicholas Cage something where he can do something kooky and he can do some characters and absolutely just have fun and, uh, lose himself in a role. And I'm going to be there to watch it, man. Cause he's, he's given us so many great things. I mean, he's so great in that first kick-ass movie. Uh, part of the reason I like that movie so much is because he's so much fun in it. Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I think I'm on the record. I wasn't a big fan of that movie. I was much more a fan of the book than I was the movie. Not to sound like one of those people, kids. My apologies, those snobs. Like the book is so much better than the movie. 
I don't mean it like that. I just didn't get as much out of the film as other people did. But uh, yeah, did, by the way, did you see the one that he did? I want to say it's on Netflix. And he did it with, um, God, I can't remember the actor's name now. But th- there's a great meme that came from where they're both in the car. Pedro Pascal. Mm-hmm. And the, the meme is Pascal smiling, that, that wild-eyed smile at him. That movie's really good if you haven't checked it out. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's worth your time. Again, man, just coming from out of nowhere. Just like we said, just a career resurgence, man. So in terms of this movie, I'm going to go ahead and say this. This is something I usually say to the last. Phil, this entire Ghost Rider property has reboot written all over it. Not because we want to get rid of what Cage did or anything like that. It's not about him. It's just about, like you said, that this character is so visually appealing and there's so much going for it in terms of that. And plus, this story can be worked with where, you know, certain plot devices can be tweaked and make it work for today's audience versus then or even the 60s and 70s. But man, this I think this has reboot written all over it. Do you think? I, I mean, I assume I assume you're going to say yes, and at some point they're going to tackle it. But I mean, wonder wonder why they haven't yet. Do we have any reason why they've not tackled this specific character? Because I have no idea why. Um, I know that there was some talk about bringing him back and doing some TV stuff um, because he was a part of uh, one of the seasons of Agents of Shield. Mm-hmm. And man, the idea of just doing like a paranormal um, kind of villain of the week. Uh, Ghost Rider ride from town to town um, thing sounds very, very cool. Um, I think the idea of a TV show actually sounds better than a movie. Like, kind of do something in, a, in the vein of the Netflix shows, um, especially now that they're retooling uh, the Disney Plus shows and they're kind of doing a more like the, those Netflix shows. I think, man, Ghost Rider would be perfect for that. Uh, you don't necessarily have to reboot it and do like this, like, big hollywood production but man again telling you this idea of him just going from town to town and solving problems almost like a walker texas ranger like kung fu thing Mm -hmm. with like paranormal stuff that sounds like a lot of fun dude i would so be here for that i i think i'm with you i think this has got more of a you know moon knight for whatever reason phil may not be remembered fondly which i thought it was great I thought it was great too, but you know, p- people like to crap on everything. It's fine. But you know, Ethan Hawke, if for no other reason, dude, Ethan Hawke is freaking phenomenal. Yes. Um, He's such a good actor. Yeah. And I mean, they've carved out a nice little lane for themselves on Disney mm-hmm. plus with the paranormal stuff with WandaVision and now the Agatha show. It seems like this was kind of be a good spot for Ghost Rider if they want to do it. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, this is, and, you know, we've covered plenty of stuff here, man, where I'm like, I don't know how they follow it up. I don't know how they could redo it. We were just talking about the Black Panther thing off the air. Like, you know, it, Chadwick Boseman, I, I I know I know you do for sure. But like, because, I mean, you, you're a huge fan like I am. I mean, to this day, it's still a shocker. Like, you go back and watch footage of him. He's just so full of life. And it's like suddenly he's no longer here. And it's just, it's just the worst. But you and I have spoken specifically about that, like, if you could get his opinion and say, what would you like to see? I guarantee the guy would say this character needs to continue this. It, it's too important to people to just let it stop with me. Now, easier said than done, Phil, because of course, a lot of people are emotionally attached to that first movie, mm-hmm. myself included. Like, and it's, it would be really, really hard to replace him. So, you know, five years from now, perhaps. I don't think Marvel's in any rush. But again, Ghost Rider is not that. And, you know, I, I don't think these movies are remembered like, oh, it was a waste of money or they're hurt. Now, part two, we don't have to talk about that. But <laughs> the first movie, the first movie is good enough. But again, Phil, for me, it's just about bringing the character in, into the modern times. I mean, I just think it makes all the sense in the world. Yeah, uh, I would definitely like to see them recast uh, Johnny Blaze at some point to like a, maybe a younger version and do some origin stuff with him. I think that could be really cool. I love the idea of the villain of the week going from town to town. Did you ever watch Renegade, by the way? I didn't. Um, you know the show I'm talking about? I don't. Lorenzo Lamas. <laughs> Remember that guy? Yes. Look. 
I that was one of those really shows that was really, really easy to binge because they made a ton of them. And Lorenzo Lamas, not the best actor maybe you've ever seen. <laughs> and maybe if I went back to it now, I'd be like, oh, this is hard to watch. But dude, he rode a he rode a, a cool looking bike to every town. You know, I think he was an ex cop or something. I forget what the story is, but that that would kind of have a, a Ghost Rider vibe to it, man. I think that would be pretty cool. Yeah, no, no, I I've just looked up the like the like the Renegade opening. I just don't. Re- I didn't remember that that was the name of the show. But now that I'm seeing like uh, Lorenzo and everything from the show, I remember this. Yeah, mm. I didn't watch the show, but I do remember it. Uh, but yeah, this is this is perfectly what I mean. Like, there's so many things that you could play off from that time period that fits that vibe of Ghost Rider, like you said, Renegade. Um, I mean, even like some vein of like Buffy. There's so many things you could do. I think with that, if they really wanted to. Yeah, yeah, I'd be here. I'd be here for that. I do think it makes more sense than doing a movie. And look, you know, they've done a great job. I think Phil of doing these these uh, Disney streamers and incorporating those characters into the films. I think that'd make perfect sense. So, kids, let's let's dive into this because there's a lot to talk about. First off, let's talk about Cage's hairpiece. Now, here's what I'll tell you. Because <laughs> I remember at the time when this thing was done, not the hairpiece, the movie, that, like, they really wanted to young him up yes. because they couldn't have this guy be 40. Because, you know, let's see, this movie came out in 97, and Nick Cage or was 2007. I thought it was 2007. My apologies. He was 43 when the first Ghost Rider came out. By the way, in really, really good shape. Can we say he looked really good? Yeah, looked he looked pretty good for his age, but uh, yeah. he definitely was uh, over the age that they were trying to uh, present in this movie. <laughs> That's it. That's it exactly. Yeah, they couldn't have that receding hairline. Would not have been a good look. And look, this also. You know, we've talked before about his string of hits. We've talked about actors that have like a string of hits. Will Smith is one of them. They just one after one, one after another, after another. I mean, The Rock was in 96, Con Air 97, Face Off 97, Gone in 60 Seconds 2000, The National Treasure Films 2004 to 2007, leading directly into Ghost Rider. So he was still, you know, a pretty hot property coming into this movie, man. I just don't know if I ever could have imagined him being Ghost Rider. I think I would have... Imagine more of Ghost Rider in this movie is Danny Ketch. And then if you wanted to have Nick Cage as the big name co-star, he is the original, not the original, but he's the second writer. He's Johnny Blaze. Like, to me, that would have made the most sense, Phil. And if they do another Ghost Rider, I guess that's what we could say, right? You could still bring Cage back and say he's Johnny Blaze, but this Ghost Rider is Danny Ketch, maybe. Yeah. I think there's some cool stuff you can do with it. Uh, and I, I wouldn't be mad at the idea again because I I didn't mind him in the role. I thought he was good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought he was good too. There's there's moments of this movie being a little hokey. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> there are definitely things here that do not work. Yeah, but no, I I think he's fine. I, I wasn't too happy with him at the time because something else I remember is seeing an interview with him and I should have tracked that thing down for this. But the whole pointing thing, the 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 Hogan, you, the thing that he does. Yes. He was incorporating like an Elvis vibe into this character because he wanted to make it his own. Yeah. If I'm remembering the quote correctly, I'm thinking, yeah, but this isn't your character. This character has been established for years. You just have to play him. Like, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I could see that. See, he was trying to do this thing where, and I don't think, I don't. I didn't necessarily hate it, uh, but uh, you had this character that's a part of a traveling circus, and mm-hmm. uh, then he's like a daredevil and all these things. And uh, so you're trying to play up the showmanship of guys like Super Dave and Elvis, and um, I understood that, but it kind of doesn't fit tonally with some of the more darker themes of this movie. Um, but it's Nicholas Cage. Like, I cannot be mad. <laughs> <laughs> he never really becomes Johnny Blaze, does he? He's kind of just Nick Cage through this whole movie. No, it, it's just, it's kind of like he's doing like this entertainer with a dark side, and I don't even think that that's a bad movie. I think that the way that he plays it, I think it works, but it doesn't necessarily fit some of the stuff from the comics. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I, I agree. And we should note for the record, kids, Cage is a huge comic book fan. Yes. Didn't I see or didn't I read several years back that he sold that collection that he had, I believe? Uh, I'm sure. I, I, I think I read that same thing, but that's why I was saying at the top of the show, this guy has wanted to be a part of a comic book movie for a long time because he's a big yeah. fan of the genre. And so seeing him in this and actually having fun, being a part of something that kind of fits with his aesthetic at the time, I was here for it. And again, not a perfect movie by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, <laughs> it's Nicolas Cage and he's going to ham up things like uh, him hamming up the transformations, I think is one of the most fun things about this. Um, you could go into his his uh, portrayal of uh, Johnny Blaze and some things like the pointing, but uh, man, when he starts transforming into Ghost Rider and he's like cackling and also like looking like he's hurting and he's, he, you, you can see this duality of his character while he's transforming. So, so cool. That is very much a, I'm Caster Troy from Face Off when he's co- all coked up, remember? Yes, or or <laughs> or uh, in Kick-Ass when he's uh, on fire and he's trying to talk uh, Hit Girl through how to how to uh, beat the bad guys. Oh my God, dude. And then you use the kryptonite. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, it's something else to behold, man, I'll tell you. But that's classically him, you know? Or other famous uh, meme. Not the bees. No. <laughs> By the way, that moment of his first transformation felt like something right out of a Sam Raimi film. It did. It did. And maybe that's why I liked it so much. <laughs> uh, By the way, we're talking about what a big fan he is. He lobbied very hard to play this role. So good for him on that. I appreciate that. And also, he had to have a tattoo covered with makeup in order to play this character. I'm not sure where the tat is. Hmm. But the tat feel is of Ghost Rider. Oh, wow. Isn't that cool? See? That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, we, we appreciate people that want to be in our world, okay? That's that's all I can tell you. That's So when actors come out of a movie and you know that they worked really hard to get into it and they had a blast, yeah, it just means more for nerds. I don't know why it does, but it means more to us. Because I guess because they take the source material seriously, Phil. They're not making fun of it as they're doing it. Maybe that's what we're talking about. But yeah, I enjoyed him in this, honestly. Um, and you know, everybody's screaming about Mephisto. We have been hearing for years since the MCU started. Well, maybe it's Mephisto. Well, what happened? Well, maybe it's Mephisto. Oh, there's a doorbell? Doorbell rang? Maybe it's Mephisto. Every movie, every streamer, everything, Phil. Maybe it's Mephisto. We've already had Mephisto. It's Peter Fonda. I don't know why we're so upset. Like, by the way, Peter Fonda... It was Nick Cage. He, Nick Cage wanted him for this movie. Peter Fonda is a freaking legend. I love that the first thing out of his mouth is, what does he say, right on when he said, with the first thing he says, I think? I just, I love Peter Fonda, man. I think he's freaking great. And I love that he's Mephisto in this movie, man. What'd you think about him here? I thought it worked with, with what they're doing here and like the style of movie. It, and I think you're right on it. It has that vibe of uh, that era of, uh, a lot of the cheesy uh, uh, made for TV or uh, Evil Dead stuff. It has that vibe, that, that vibe of like Sam Raimi or even like the Hercules and the Xena show. And I think that's what I liked about it. And so when you think like Pete Fine in this world, like, yeah, that, that works. That fits. And it was far out. That's what he said. I got the line wrong. That was awesome. I just, again, I th- like you said, I think it fits. I love how, of course, he doesn't age because that wouldn't make any sense if he did. That worked, and uh, I just think he's. By the way, Phil, it got me. It got me thinking about this. If you're casting, you don't have to cast Ghost Rider. We can talk about that or not talk about it. But if you're going to recast Mephisto, what actor do you think that's current would fit this? I was thinking Brian Cranston would be an amazing choice to play Mephisto, but he may be saved for something else. Who do you think could pull this off? I think Cranston's a good shout. Um... Mm-hmm. Which makes me think, man, if you're gonna go Cranston, man, why just why not just go Paul and have him as Ghost Rider? Be kind of cool. <laughs> hey, you know, he might be too old for the role at this point, but also could be kind of cool. Yeah, I mean, Cage was forty three. I don't know how old Cranston is. Yeah, I don't. I don't. <laughs> now I'm gonna go down the rabbit hole and see how old. <laughs> 
Which you know, you know, Aaron Paul is. Aaron Paul is currently forty-five. Oh well, there you go. Cranston's got to be at least. He's probably pushing fifty-five, isn't he? Yeah, Um, I would think that would be kind of that might be too on the nose of doing Cranston and Aaron Paul in a Ghost Rider TV show. But I wouldn't be mad at it. (laughs) Definitely (laughs) get people to watch it. Yeah. And just so we're being clear, kids, in case you're not a Marvel Comics fan or in case you don't know how this classic literature from the story of Faust, Mephisto is not the devil. He's probably a, a top general, but he's not the devil himself. Very fixated on taking uh, Peter Parker's uh, marriage for some reason. I don't know yeah. why that was a thing, but yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the most controversial storylines in the history of Marvel Comics. That one more day storyline. Jesus. Yeah, and they managed to do their version of it with uh, No Way Home, and I don't think Mm -hmm. people picked up on that. Yeah. Oh, it hit me. They're going to start production on uh, number four next year, next summer, so we'll see how that plays out because some of the rumors I've read are a little scary about all the stuff they're wanting to cram into this movie. Yeah. I'm trying to think other people for Mephisto. See, once you really start thinking about it, because you like a well-spoken, older actor, somebody that has screen presence that's, you know, I'll throw a name out and it probably won't happen. But if you're going to spend the big, buck, big bucks, I still want to see Denzel in the MCU. Yeah. Um, boy, it almost feels like I'm fixated on Breaking Bad at this point. But uh, Odin Kirk would not be a bad Mephisto when you think oh, of God. Like, his facial structure and like, like him being kind of an older guy, but also can play a very a shyster and all these things. Odin Kirk would be perfect. That's not bad. That's not bad. Yeah. He's got that vibe about him too, like of the sort of the snake oil salesman. You know what I mean? Like he can he can play those types of characters. Yeah, I think I'm be here for that. Man, there's so many good choices out there, man. Now I want to recast this whole freaking film. But he's he's a heavy, right? But he's not the primary heavy. Because we got his kid in this. His kid is Wes Bentley. Wes Bentley is one of the best looking dudes you'll ever see. And he still is great DNA. This kid has, right? I think he's excellent in this movie, Phil. He's just the right amount of, I'll turn it up when I need to. It doesn't to me anyway, it doesn't feel too over the top. He just feels like trouble. He just feels like bad news. He's, you know, pushing back against daddy. He's rebelling or whatever. Dude, I thought Bentley did a bang up job in this movie, man. Yeah, he's another one where I think visually this movie looks so cool. And I think that he looks the part. Um, I think when they do the effects, when he becomes Legion early in the movie, it actually looks pretty good. Mm-hmm. Uh, I You can get into some of the hokey uh, voice uh, modulation stuff they do with him at that but. It doesn't bother me too much because, I again, this movie knows what it wants to be. Uh, Mm. But, you know, I'm sure most people remember Wes Bentley from American Beauty. Uh, He's had uh, quite a long career. Uh, I'm sure this is, uh, for a lot of people, not what they remember him for. (laughs) But I I thought he was actually pretty good in this. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. You know, if you're going to be acting opposite Nick Cage and you're the bad guy, I mean... To be fair, Phil, you either are going to be, you're either going to be, you're either going to downplay it or you're not going to do anything. Because if you try to match Cage for charisma and antics and theatricality, it's not going to work. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. So whether it was his direction being told here's how to play it or his choice or both, I thought it was played pretty darn well as well as it could be played for a supernatural comic book flick. Yeah, he kind of fits uh he's he's the opposite of uh Nick in a lot of ways here. Uh he's a younger guy, he's got like he's got this look to him. Uh he's got like the stereotypical leading man look to him in a lot of ways. Um boy, if you really think about it, might not have made a bad uh Johnny Blaze. But <laughs> Mm, That's also why he fits so well as kind of the uh, antithesis for him in this movie. Yeah, I agree. By the way, um, did you get into the Ghost Rider reboot when it, when the, they introduced Danny Ketch? Did you get into that series? Uh, the comic book series? Or? Yeah, yeah. I did not. 
man, I was a big fan of that. I've got a ton of those issues. Like um, Javier Salteres does the, um, I can't remember if he does interior art or just the covers, but man, he just, the revamp look just for a new generation, he just looked great, dude. And uh, I think Ketch was possessed by a different demon than Blaze was. I think is how the story went, if I'm remembering correctly. Because I think, isn't, they didn't mention the demon's name here. Do they mention it in the second film? Because I can't remember that. Uh, why am I trying to blank? I don't think that they do. I think it's uh, Zarathros, I think is how it's pronounced. Yeah. Um, and we've we've gone through a few iterations of uh, Ghost Rider at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, I I like the Robbie Reyes, and that was the version of Ghost Rider that they brought in for Agent of Shield. Mm-hmm. I think that design for Robbie Reyes is so cool with the muscle car and everything. So so cool. Yeah, I like that too. Zarathos is the name. Yeah, I don't think they ever mentioned that in the movie. Interesting. They didn't hear for sure. I just couldn't remember if they had in the second film. Yeah, that second movie is, uh, boy, oof. Yeah, no. (laughs) We're not completing this. I'm going to tell you right now. I was happy to do the first one because I like Cage, but I have zero desire to do that second one. Yeah. I mean. I can't defend that one. Yeah, we got to follow this up with a hit. Because, you know, we just did Blade Trinity. I'm just saying. Like. That thing's still been sitting, sitting with me. <laughs> it's just been sitting with me in, in not a good way. It's been sitting with me. I'm like, oh man, crap, that movie sucked. Like, oh God, it was so bad. I, I just imagined you like, like laying in bed and just like jumping out of your sleep. Like, you know, <laughs> I don't know that was coming. Oh, you know, what's funny. I, I, I bored my wife to tears throwing off random facts off the top of my head about this movie and how, and the weird stuff that happened that, you know, we talked about during that episode. And at some point she gives me this look as if to say, you know, you've already talked about this, right? And turns out I had, that's how much I was still grieving over how bad that freaking movie was. I'd already talked to her about it twice. So yeah, I don't have a life in case anyone can't figure that out. And plus it troubled me. This movie doesn't trouble me. It's it's fine. I'm again. I I like yeah, this. It's a fun movie. Yeah. And by the way, we didn't. We never mentioned Bentley's character. It's Blackheart. And Blackheart, I love that freaking character. And he also becomes Legion. We knew that was coming because all those demons and whatnot, those lost souls, are sucked up in there. And then it's I am Legion, and it's it becomes a biblical thing, and that's fine. So let's talk about. Sam Elliott, I'm going to try to do an impression. I don't know I don't know if I've ever heard anyone do an impression of Sam Elliott. Sam Elliott, Hollywood's Jake the Snake Roberts, in as much as the voice and character anyway. But, dude, Sam Elliott can do just about anything he wants. He is, for all intents and purposes, he is Johnny Blaze's Whistler, if we can make that comparison. I mean, by the way, who you got helping you out, Phil? Do you have Whistler or do you have Carter Slade? Who's got your back? I'm going Whistler, man. Yeah? I know. Sam got that horse, though, man. He does have the horse. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm going Whistler. I see it. You saw how he handled himself in the three movies. Uh, you saw how he handled himself with that shotgun. Didn't work very well at the end of uh, Trinity, but, you know. He blew away FBI agents to protect his guy. I can't be mad at that. I'm I'm not advocating violence. Everyone calm down. No violence that being advocated here. Literal ride or die friend, man. Oh, God. 100%. Yeah. By the way, we get the big reveal of Carter Slade here. And if you know the story of the original, you know, Ghost Rider in the comics, he was a cowboy. Like, then you figure out that this guy is him. That was sort of a not too well hidden secret during the course of this movie, Phil. I mean, I think even most random audience member could have said, wait a minute, I wonder if he's that cowboy. He sure dresses like one. Yeah. I thought having him as the grave digger and having him have like these ominous speeches and uh, he, at one point he breaks the shovel and he's got mm-hmm. the, the map in there. Yeah. Again, very hokey. That has that air of uh, uh, Hercules and Cena stuff that I talked about earlier, but I enjoyed it. Uh, again, that visual of uh, Carter and uh, Johnny riding side by side and 
and so so cool. Ghost Rider and Sky playing over it. Awesome. <laughs> it was awesome. Phantom Rider is what that what the uh, the character was called uh, in the books as well. Phantom Rider. So, you know, I kind of felt like they didn't use him enough here in this movie. Yeah, I would have liked to see more of him. Yeah, kind of surprising. Again, I have no recollection of the second film, but I want to say he's in it. Uh, I don't really need to think about it much. It's not a good. Yeah, I don't want to think about it. Don't get me wrong. He is not in the second film. I mean, we do get Danny Ketch in the second film. That's how much I don't remember the second film. Yeah. So Anthony Head's in Anthony Head of uh, recent Ted Lasso fame. Great actor. Yeah. Well, look, I'm not talking to him that because I ain't doing it. Boink Studios is the home of Tom Clark's main event, Tom Clark's 6M podcast, and Two Nations Under Ted, a Ted Lasso podcast. Visit the site today for links to every podcast platform, social media, special announcements, and a lot more. Check out the site and bookmark today, boinkstudios.com. Yeah, I, I love him here. I think I just think he's great. I've, I've always been a big fan of Sam Elliott's. I just, Tombstone's one of my favorite movies of all time. I think he's fantastic in this. I don't know if we've talked that all that much about Sam Elliott here on the 6M, mm. but he's fantastic. I don't want to skip past the love interest, Eva Mendez. We just spoke about Jessica Biel and Blade Trinity. I think we both kind of had the same opinion of, you know, she was out of her element in that movie. Very poorly written dialogue. And uh, I also, you know, stated that in terms of her overall acting ability, I think that sometimes she's a hit, sometimes she's a miss. For me, anyway, I, I kind of have a little bit of that with Eva Mendez as well, but I don't see anything that she does in this movie that is hard to watch. I don't really get that, apart from the typical damsel in distress stuff that a lot of combat movies kind of fall into. But I thought she did fine here. I didn't really see anything that threw me off about her performance. What do you think about her as Roxanne Simpson? Yeah, this was uh, definitely around that time period where you had to have the very, very attractive love interest for the movie. And that's why we introduced Eva Mendez, very beautiful woman. Um, I think she plays her role well enough next to uh, Nick Cage. I think she plays off him well when she's given material to use, but there's not much to this character. Um, so there's not really much to dislike. It's just kind of like, Hey, these two are star cross lovers. And now they are back together and, uh, emotions and feelings. Uh, <laughs> that's it. Like there's not much, like there's not much to either their relationship or her character. I think that they could have done more to develop her character here, but, um, she fits them. She fits where she's uh, given things to do. Mm -hmm. So she was born in seventy four. So she would have been thirty three in this movie instead of forty three. Yeah, uh, she's she's in very much in the Kirsten Dunst spot in this movie. Of oh man, I really like this girl, but I just couldn't make it work. But um, she's in that kind of role in this movie here, which is very stereotypical of that time period. Yeah. That's true. You know, Roxanne Simpson, character from the books, from Marvel Comics. She debuted in May 1972 in Marvel Spotlight number five. In fact, in the books, it was her dad that adopted Johnny Blaze following uh, his dad's passing. So they did stick very close uh, or fairly close to the comics, Phil, which, uh, you know, that was good. I like to see uh, connective tissue happen between the films and the books whenever possible. I, I think that, you know, your point about, you know, he, he's sort of in the Tobey Maguire role here of, you know, I like this girl, but I don't want to get hurt. I can't pull her into this. Then when he finally tells her the truth, she doesn't go running or laughing at him, which of course would never happen in real life. It's fine. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I can't say that, that things clicked with me all too well for the two of them together. Because she's like, you know, I went to school and I got a great job and you're still the same. I'm like, you're 33 and he's 43. I don't. How long did your college take exactly? Right. <laughs> I don't know. It's just me. Like, it, that's how it felt. But uh, 
Yeah, I don't know how old they're supposed to have been in this. Let's say that we're supposed to believe Cage is 33 like she is. But that's still a whole heck of a lot of time in between. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm overthinking that. But just something I kind of bumped into here. Did you did you get any sort of chemistry between the two of them in this movie? Do you think it's just kind of there? It's just kind of there. I think she fills her role. Um but it it kind of felt like more of like, hey, the studio, we need a we need a big name next to him and somebody that's like could fill the role of very attractive damsel in distress, uh, forlorn lover, and she worked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it was fine. Again, I don't know how much of it I'm really feeling, but I think it was fine. And again, as I said, I have no recollection of that second movie. But uh, she's not in it. I don't believe. He's not in it. No. Interesting. She's like, yeah, I've had enough of that. Yeah. Y'all go ahead and make that movie. I won't be around. Yeah. I, I, I love to think the idea of she like reading the script and Ghost Rider was like urinated in fire at the screen. And she's like, yeah, nah, I'm good. <laughs> oh, my God. You do remember more than I do. Holy yeah, crap. Nah, I'm good. I'm going to go over here and do this, uh, do this movie about uh, conjoined twins. Leave me alone. Yeah. Yes. Oh, what a bad movie. Ooh, man, what a bad movie. A few things here before we continue with the cast. Number one, Johnny Depp was interested in playing Ghost Rider, which now I want to really, really see a Johnny Depp Ghost Rider film. I think he would have been great. At At a certain time, that would have been perfect. Yeah. Like when he was like maybe 30s or so, that would have been really good. Yeah, I agree. Eric Bana was also in heavy contention to play him. That would have been a little too much for me. The Hulk's now playing Ghost Rider. Yeah. Uh, wasn't Sam Elliott in that Hulk movie as well? Well, we're, we tried not to think about that movie, but yes, yeah. it was. Yeah. He was Thunderbolt Ross. Yeah, man. By the way, speaking of Nick Cage, what a, what a fan he is. His son is named Kal-El. Wow. We know that uh, they wanted him at one point for the Green Goblin in the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movie. And, of course, we know all about the Tim Burton uh, Superman project. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I I just immediately think of uh, his son, like, pushing a, a plate off the table. And his wife's like, Kalil, no. <laughs> By the way, uh Shout out Kevin Smith. Got the best story ever about that Tim Burton Superman movie. His story <laughs> is, it's phenomenal. Like, I'm sure you've seen it. Like, yeah, best story ever. He's talking about the giant spider and how, uh, God. dude, they how really was his name? Was just, spider. <laughs> yeah, he really wanted that spider. But then he goes to see that horrible Wild Wild West movie. And he's like, wait a minute. Is that a giant spider? Like, yeah. So, wow, he got his freaking spider, man. Hey man, Nick, Nicholas Cage got his place, his chance to play Superman in the Flash movie as well. Uh, that's fair. Yeah, it's a uh, very CGI, but he got a chance. Got his chance. I don't know that he knew it was going to be in there. A lot of folks seem to not know that Warner Brothers are going to use that footage. Uh, did that documentary about that movie ever get made? By the way, I don't know. That's a good question. I know are we talking they, about um, about the Superman movie? It did. I've, I still have yet to see it. It looked cool. It's it's very good. There's a lot of behind the scenes stuff. And as much as their their version of Clark Kent would have been effing weird, when you see Cage dressed as Clark and he's getting into character, he's feeling his way around live as it happens on camera. Hmm. And you're like, holy cow, I think this would have worked. Because it would have been a different version of Superman. Boy, that's for sure. Yeah. But yeah, by the way, speaking of Mr. Blaze, you got the Carpenters and you got the Jelly Beans. What in the world is going on here? <laughs> like yeah. uh, uh, the, the, the very hokey aspects of this film, stuff like the Jelly Bean Martini. I don't know what that was supposed to be. Uh, no. Nah. Yeah. It just all feels like his own additions, Cage's own additions to the movie. Yeah, it felt like Cage trying to add uh, little quirks to the character, and yeah, some of it did not work at all. Mm. Yeah, I don't. Um, 
I don't get it. That was some of the stuff, too, that kind of threw me off when this movie first came out. I'm like, all right, this is going to be too much. I just remember at the time not having, not walking away from it with a great opinion of it. But after we've had years of Cage just being Cage and being applauded for never backing down and being who he is, I guess maybe I see this in a different light, perhaps. We also had to mention Matt Long was young Johnny Blaze. Matt Long went on to keep acting. Don't know how much that he actually looked like Cage. But let me tell you something. Raquel Alessi, as young Roxanne Simpson, look her up, Phil. Her current picture, dude, she could pass for her younger sister here. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. uh, That was the other interesting thing. When you do see younger uh, Johnny Blaze, it's like, oh, this guy might have been pretty good at the leading role in this movie. He was very good, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he was very good. Definitely looked the part. He was in an NBC show called Manifest, where this uh, this plane had disappeared. Actually, the plane had wrecked. I don't know, disappeared in the ocean. I can't remember now. But the plane lands. They don't know it. The plane lands, and it causes a worldwide controversy because that plane's been missing for like five years. And it's like, five, I think it's five years later, and they're all the same age. And uh, they have since canceled that show, which sucks. But uh, it was it was interesting until it got to be a little too hokey. But uh, he's in that show. He's very good in that show, too. Kind of sounds like uh, Lost. does sound like. It also sounds like uh, the 4400. Yeah. With um, Mahershala Ali in that show. So. Donald Logue is back, kids. Man, we've talked about this guy quite a bit here. Just talked about him on that first Blade movie. He's Mac. I like Donald Logue a lot, Phil. This kind of felt like it could have been anybody because they killed him and didn't even think twice about it. This guy didn't even get a, a crack at a second movie. Like, yeah. that was kind of weird to me. I don't know. It kind of felt like he should have been more of an important character, but I guess they disagreed with that. Uh, uh, yeah, I thought he worked well as uh, uh, Johnny's like assistant slash uh, helper guy, and then they just kind of killed him off, and it just mm-hmm. was over. I was like, all right, well, great, cool. <laughs> well, thanks for playing. We appreciate it. See you next time. Yeah, I thought that was maybe a missed opportunity because he was part of Johnny's crew that kind of took care of him behind the scenes. And Johnny keeps pushing the envelope with every stun he does and, you know, more and more and more. And because he knows he can't be killed because he's tried and he can't be killed, I guess, because he's being protected this whole time. So, yeah, very much an evil Knievel character. Phil, I've got some years on you. Do, do you have any like appreciation for the evil can evil stuff? I mean, was it ever on your radar any time when you were growing up as a kid? I uh, know. By the time I was growing up, Super Dave was everywhere. Super Dave was the thing. Right. He had a cartoon. He was he was a huge deal. Funny stand up comic too, man. Very yes. funny guy. That voice. Oh my god, that voice. Oh, <gasps> always sound like. <laughs> yeah. Super Dave was hilarious to me. Yeah, it was a fun show. Evil Knievel was a real deal, man. I think supposedly he had broken every bone in his body. I forget. It's like, it's a big number. Yeah, man. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in this movie, of course, that just that just reminds us of that or reminds, I guess, certain people of that. Again, if you're a certain age, then you remember all about Evil Knievel. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and of course, he's been... Uh... He's been spoofed. He's been an inspiration for a lot of characters. There's a Simpson episode where they do the bit with Evil Knievel. And yeah, I think that when you look at like the Johnny Blaze character and what he's supposed to be, like the circus act, circus act that ends up being a superhero. Yeah, that kind of fits with Dave, with Evil Knievel. Yeah, I think so. And um, some of the footage that you see, let's see, on the tour bus when they're watching footage of the rider that's an actual motorcycle rider that's travis pastrana who they're watching because it did feel like real footage that they're watching on their tv there Hmm. the uh the jelly beans yep that was that was that was cage's idea did you notice that they were all yellow and red for the color of fire by the way i did not (laughs) we saw them enough how'd you miss it oh boy that's yeah silly he came up with the idea because if Johnny made a deal with the devil, he would do things that are safe and childlike instead of drinking Jack Daniels. I can't hate that, if I'm being honest. 
it's not a terrible thought kind of thought process for it, but it, it is a bit silly. A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. But uh yeah. Let's see. Uh Samuel, it was the only choice for the caretaker character. And uh because he was really, really good in this movie for what little bit he had to do. And supposedly he was a huge fan of Cage's coming into this and was happy to do the part. They were actually neighbors in Malibu at the time. Oh wow. Yeah. See, Nick I think I think a lot of what worked about this is people wanted to root for Nick Cage. I agree with that. By the way, that kid Matt Long we were talking about as a young Nick Cage wore a prosthetic nose so he could more closely resemble Cage. I can't get over the hairpiece, by the way. I'm looking at it right now. Holy so, Lord. So great. <laughs> Because even if you didn't know it wasn't his hair, you'd go, wait a minute, is that his hair? That's so great. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Oh, man. You know what recently made me think about it? And I was like, oh, he's looking younger. He looks, hair looks different. Um, When when Punk first came back to WWE and he was cutting his hair that way so he could have, like, the bangs in front and it looked like, it made him look a bit younger. I was like, this looks like, this looks like Nick and, and, and uh, it goes brighter a little bit. Oh my God. Got a hairpiece on. Oh no. <laughs> hey, well, I mean, it, it, I guess it works for some guys. I never tried that, but, uh, I never had uh black hair, man. That's just, that's my color right there, buddy. I never had those jeans. Never had good jeans. They're good enough, I suppose, but not that good. Don't have those Coppola jeans. And, and plus the dude works out three hours a day to get in shape for this movie. And when you get that scene of him in the mirror, naked from the waist up, people were talking about those abs are CG. Like I heard that for years. And dude, everybody on that production says that was actually Nick Cage with the shirt off. Wow. Uh, Again, he visually, I thought it looked great. Like a lot of posters for this movie. um, There's a really great poster where they do the half uh, Ghost Rider face. And like when you look at him black and white with like his cheekbones and everything, it looks great. Mm-hmm. It does it does yeah he really i mean i was gonna say he looks the part there's no part to look for ghost rider but he's you know he does look like he fits at least to that regard we're talking about evil knievel so the scene of johnny blaze coming down on that ramp after jumping those trucks and the way he crashes again if you know that if you know uh, evil knievel it's identical to evil knievel look, look it up sometime phil it's horrifying the way he came off that bike and crashing that ramp. It's a wonder it didn't kill him. And that jump happened at Caesar's Palace on December 31st at 67. Yeah, crazy. Crazy. Him and Peter Fonda both were very much like embraced, I think, later on by like the Generation, not Generation X, but like the X Games kids. Yeah. Especially Knievel. They, he was like a god to them, man. Yeah. I would totally understand why. Yeah, same. Yeah. Well, let's see. Also in this cast, kids, because we don't want to leave out uh, anybody, let's talk about the three dudes that were hanging out with Blackheart, the Fallen Angels, not Christopher Daniels, Lawrence uh, Lawrence Brules as Gressel, Daniel Fredrickson as Wallow, Matthew Wilkinson as Abigor. That's Earth, Wind, and Water, not Earth, Wind, and Fire, Phil. Yes. That had been fun. Yeah, you had to have some... Uh some uh, henchmen for Ghost Rider to beat up at some point. And I thought, uh, like, their fights with him worked. I thought mm-hmm. they were cool. Uh, man, again, Ghost Rider looks great in this movie. Uh, I think the way that they, uh, the way they depicted the penance there ended up looking really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, stuff like Ghost Rider coming out of that water and the bike and everything still being, like, lit with flame and everything. So, so cool. Uh, the fight that he has underwater. Uh, which which w- I don't remember each uh, Fallen Angels' names. Also great. Uh, some of the way he beats these Fallen Angels, uh, kind of kind of beats them kind of quick, kind of looks ridiculous, but semantics. <laughs> yeah, dude, once he gets his hands on them, it's pretty much over. Yeah. But Ghost Rider also is a very powerful character. I don't think people um, understand, like, he is pretty powerful in the comic books. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. I wonder what level Ghost Rider would be considered. That penance stare is a cool, cool power. I always like that. 
they call it the penance stair because I guess you couldn't really call it. Now, you just go over and sit down and think about what you did. I guess it's too wordy. <laughs> so they just call it the penance stair. Let's see. We've also got, we talked about this guy here before, Brett Cullen. And he is great as Johnny's dad here. We've talked about this guy before. If you kids have been paying attention, you know that he was in The Dark Knight Rises as a congressman. He was also Thomas Wayne in the in that freaking Joker movie that I don't want to talk about. Yeah, And uh, we've talked about him here also, Phil, because he was on uh, the Lakers show because he played Bill Sharman. He was in Winning Time, The Rise of the Lakers Dynasty. His career goes back a lot of years. He's done a lot of stuff, man. I mean, we didn't see a whole, whole lot of him here, but I thought he was good. I thought for the little bit he had to do that he fit the part. And dude, when when Johnny's telling him that he's going to run away with her and he turns around and looks at him and he gets all teary-eyed and he tosses him the, the keys to the bike, I guess, I'm thinking... This guy's such a good actor. Like it, it was a very, very brief moment, but I was kind of really happy when that moment happened. Do you know what I mean? Like I really enjoyed that. Yeah, he does a lot of really great acting uh, in a movie that kind of doesn't deserve <laughs> such a great portrayal. But <laughs> oh my god, what a great way to put it! You think when they yelled "cut," they're like, "Hey, Brett, can I speak to you?" You don't really need to do all that. That's not the kind of movie, Brett. Listen, we're here to make this uh, very cheesy, uh, kid-friendly comic book movie. Um, but I think that's some of uh, what I can see people not liking about this movie, by the way, uh, hmm. is that uh, even what you explained about the jelly bean thing, um, I think when you think Ghost Rider, you think you can make like this very, very um scary comic book movie like now i think you can make a totally different movie with it and you could really push the edges of this but this was before they were willing to do a rated r uh comic book movie like a lot of this stuff has changed with the advent of blade and um uh deadpool kicking that door open for r-rated um comic book movies where this could this could be a different movie today but they very much wanted this movie to be kid friendly in a lot of ways but there's so much dark tones to it and themes that it feels like that kind of clashes with what they want to do several times here i agree with that it would be a completely different movie today i think it'd be excellent i really i really want them to make this happen now the more i think about it, the more i want to make it happen because i think it would just be phenomenal man i don't know how it couldn't be by the way and and again, I just love the idea of like, Brett, we're going to need you to pull it back just a little bit, buddy. I, I don't know. I don't know why that cracks me up so much. So we said that this this came out on February 16th in the U.S. 2007. It's worth noting here that the jump that he does over the helicopters, like the, you know, the, the goalpost to goalpost motorcycle jump in Vegas. On December 31st, 2007, a guy named Robbie Madison made that jump. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Dude, get this distance. 322.625 feet. Like, I, I can't... That is... I, I don't know. I got to look that up. I bet it's breathtaking to watch. Hmm. Yeah, I have to see that. Breathtaking to watch. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. By the way, you know, Phil, how we mentioned that Cage was working out three hours a day to get in shape? Well, guess what else took three hours a day? To put that hairpiece on his head. That's not a joke. <laughs> three hours a day. Three hours, including makeup, I take it? I, d I don't know. I guess they could do that as he's in the chair. I don't know. But, like, three hours a day and it still looks like that? I don't know. Three hours of uh, hairpiece installation is pretty funny. Hairpiece installation. So I heard you work on the new Ghost Rider film. So what are you doing over there, those guys? I'm the hairpiece installer. For the what now? Yeah, I don't get it. This movie was originally budgeted at $65 million, but soon the production costs went up once Nick Cage came on board and demanded a hefty fee to play the lead. He also demanded that the Ghost Rider had to look photorealistic in post-production, which increased the production costs even more. The production then hit $110 million, almost double of what was projected. Well, good for him. Yeah, and he was right, because I do think that that helped a lot with the, this movie of just how good Ghost Rider looked. What do we say about Snipes in the the Blade Training movie? Where's my money, honey? I'm just saying. <laughs> I, I don't know what's going on with my pay. 
Like Cage, like I'd love to do that. Like Cage lobbied to do this, so they say yes. Thank, thanks, guys. By the way, since I'm here, I'm gonna need a lot of money to do this movie. By the way, this is this is my fee. And yeah. hey, I really want this uh, Ghost Rider to look good. I don't don't have to do this. You know, make him look good. Yeah, I ain't got to do it. But since I'm here, and by the way, here's how good he looks. The computer-generated skull was made from a 3D X-ray taking of Nick Cage's actual skull. So, wow! Yeah, I didn't know that either. It's cool, right? It's awesome. They went the uh, they went the extra mile. This is one of the few Marvel comic-based movies in which Stan Lee does not appear because he had no involvement in the creation of the original Ghost Rider. Yeah, I knew that. That is a factoid, Danny. Yeah. Let's see. Talking about Wes Bentley, I knew Wes Bentley had issues. And uh, I, I honestly, I didn't remember it until now. According to an interview he gave the New York Times in 2010, this movie was made during the middle of Wes Bentley's decade-long, extremely serious addiction to cocaine and heroin. He said in that interview that he only accepted any movie roles during that time so that he would have any money to buy enough drugs. Yikes. So, dude, this was not a good time for this guy. But, you know, to be honest... I don't know what the guy, how the guy would have acted this part had he been clean. But again, I didn't see anything that... Dude, do you think on some level it played in? Hard to know that, isn't it? I don't know. <laughs> That's not, what I, not where I thought you were going with that. But oh, right. where, where was it going? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I just... I don't know. You hear about working actors who who are like functioning addicts on set. Well, not on set, but at least in the, in the film or TV show. And then you hear, wait a minute, that guy was high the whole time. Like I didn't know. Like, uh, yeah, I wouldn't have guessed that. Wow. Crazy. Matthew Perry springs to mind. Good Lord. Rest in peace, Matthew Perry. What a loss, man. Jeez. Let's see. Uh, the only two cast members we didn't mention here are the police chief. We have another police chief that doesn't get, uh, too much going on here. Actually, um, yeah, David Roberts as Captain Jack Dolan, a police captain. We also have uh, Brett Swain as police officer and Jessica Napier as the waitress. This is Rebel Wilson's film debut. I actually knew that as well because I, I remember her being in this movie and I saw her in something else, but I always remember her from this movie. It's kind of one of those weird cameos like thinking of uh, Lucy Lawless in the Spider-Man movie. Well done. Yeah, that's right. We have We have talked about that for sure. Tom Clark 6M Podcast is sponsored in part by Radius Law Group. Every day, Radius helps individuals, families, small businesses, and nonprofit organizations throughout North Carolina, Florida, and Pennsylvania resolve their legal issues by providing effective legal counsel in the areas of estate planning as well as elder law and Medicaid. Radius Law holds the radical belief that working with a lawyer can indeed be enjoyable. So give them a call at 1-800-519-5667 for more information and tell them that Tom Clark 6M Podcast sent you. All right, well, look, I said we were going to talk about it. Uh, we're going to talk about that freaking director here, this freaking Mark Steven Johnson guy. His credits aren't bad, okay? He did both Grumpy Old Men movies, classics in my opinion. He did the Simon Birch movie, the Jack Frost movie. Uh, he didn't He didn't direct Jack Frost. Um, excuse me, let me back up. He wrote the Grumpy Old Men movies. He did not direct them. He did direct Simon Birch. He did not direct... Jack Frost, but he was the writer on those films. He did direct When in Rome and Killing Season and a movie called Finding Steve McQueen in 2019, Love Guaranteed and Love in the Villa. Love in the Villa was his last was his last um, credit as a director, but he's written on quite a bit too. But here's why I got a problem with this guy. He also wrote Grudge Match, which is not the worst movie I've ever seen, also not the best one either. Mark Steven Johnson directed Daredevil. So that's why I got a major beef uh, with this guy. Oh, uh, yeah, I forgot. Dude, I've never forgotten this guy's name because of that freaking Daredevil movie. Yeah. Um, yeah, when you look at his film credits and then his four way, foray into these comic book movies, uh, it's uh, a wonder that that happened. But, yeah, I think that that's also why a lot of uh, hardcore fans uh, dislike this movie because they tie it to that time period and the Daredevil movie, which... Oh, the Daredevil movie is not good. Uh, but if you ask me the t- of the two, which one I prefer, I actually prefer this movie. I mean, you would have to prefer this movie. Daredevil is hot garbage. I mean, it's unwatchable. Oh, like bad, bad movie. And I, 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 
it's one of those things where on, during the message board era, I always had that argument with people like, well, you got to watch the director's uh, cut because the director's cut is actually good. And I've seen the director's Shh. cut. It's uh, it's it's moderately better, but it's still not a very good movie. Dude, I've told this story before. I'm sure I've told it here on the show. When that movie kicked off with the accident with the barrel of toxic waste and when he wakes up, the IV sounds like a sledgehammer to him. I thought I, I went with a really good friend of mine at the time. I looked at him and we're like whispering. I'm like, dude, F and A, man, they nailed it. Oh my God, this is going to be good. And then it, the movie actually started and we're like, oh, oh no. <laughs> what, what, what happened? The scene with him and her in the playground on the seesaw in broad daylight yeah. fighting. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Dude, I looked to my buddy who's sitting to my left. He belly laughed so hard. People turned around to see what was happening in our in our seats. That's how loud he laughed. <laughs> and uh, we're just shaking our He's like, dude, what is this crap? I was like, yeah, because we were both big comic book guys, man. Ev- the Evanescence, uh, <laughs> boy. That freaking song. Ah, what a bad movie. <laughs> oh, that freaking song. Um, I, which was referenced, uh, if you're watching Agatha All Along, it was referenced in Agatha All Along because uh, the teen character, I won't spoil who he is, he has an Evanescence poster in his room. He does. That's right. That kid's great, by the way. Uh, yeah, he's doing a great job. Yeah, really, really good. I didn't see that twist coming at all. Like, uh, I guess I should have. I totally didn't. Because there was enough done to throw you off the trail where you where you wouldn't have believed what you're seeing anyway. So yeah, what a great reveal! Uh, I don't want to get into uh, gushing over that show, but what a great reveal for him at the end of that episode, and then the following episode where it gets into his uh, origin story. Very very good. Well done. Best episode of the series so far for me um, was that origin episode. I agree with that. Yeah, like I said, I this guy's only done two comic book films. Uh, talking about Mark Stephen Johnson, and that's enough. We don't need him to do any more. We're good. Yeah, a lot of fans are not a fan of this guy at all. Mm-mm. Not a fan. Yeah, I, I don't. Uh, yeah, we don't need it done again. Now, what's funny is, as 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 crappy of a, of a director. Well, I well okay, as crappy of a job as he did on that Daredevil movie. There's some choices made here that aren't terrible, and some of the stuff going in, you know. And by the way, Phil, we have to point out that Cage had a hand in writing sections of the script. Uh, yeah. I mean, we kind of just brought you in to play the part. I don't know. But, you know, Mark Steven Johnson wrote and directed this movie. So had Cage not pitched in, what would we have gotten? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I, I would like to think a part of uh, what makes this movie good is, is Nick Cage fighting for some things. Yeah. 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 So to create the voice, by the way, what would you think about Ghost Rider's voice? Sometimes it works. Uh, sometimes it's kind of... Uh, it's kind of not great. Like, uh, there are some funny bits to it. Like when he's like doing the, uh, 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 or like just oh, making these still... noises and stuff. <laughs> it's like, uh, I don't know how well it works, but, uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, stuff that was not, by the way, that pen and stare, are they dead? I mean, I don't think they are. When he first uses it on that dude in the alley, when that dude hits the ground, they make a point to show him blink his eyes as if to say, don't worry, guys. We didn't kill him. Yes. Um, I don't know. But again, this movie is very kid friendly. They want to make you they, they don't show a lot of uh, they don't show a lot of over the top violence. They don't show a lot of stuff where it looks like, oh, yeah, that guy's dead. They are like they kind of reassure you like, no, no, look, look, kid, he's still moving. He's not. He's yeah. not dead. Yeah, don't worry about it. It's fine. We took care of him. A few ibuprofen. He never felt a thing. The reason I ask about his voice. This is uh, actually pretty cool. All of Nick Cage's lines as Ghost Rider were spoken by him. Then they took those that voice and filtered through the lines through three different kinds of animal growls, played backwards, covering three separate frequencies, then played them through a mechanical volumizer before finally giving them a fiery crackle. Oh, cool. I did not know that. Very cool. They compared it to a deep demonic mechanical lion's roar. Yeah, I don't know if it had that kind of impact for me, but I see what the point of it was. I think it's fine. 
Yeah, man. Again, I think the parts where it worked the best was when he was transforming, and he's you can tell he's still got his own voice, and um, you can see the agony of him turning, but also like this, like kind of like this release of the demon being excited that he's getting released. Um, I thought in those scenes it worked up very well. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. So for his transformation. We talked about, you know, he handed up. It's the Sam Raimi. I just like to call it the Sam Raimi sequence because that's what it feels like. <laughs> it was envisioned to be painful. Nicholas Cage told Mark Stephen Johnson that it was painful for Johnny, but it feels good for the Ghost Rider. Yes. Which is why during half of that, he's got that smile on his face. Yeah, I, I think that he played it very well. Yeah, it's still freaky, but hey, it's Nick Cage. It's what he does. Yeah, you know, he's going to find a way to ham something up. <laughs> yeah yeah mephisto had a western and johnny cash like look because of mark stephen johnson was tired of devils being comical and in a business suit i'm okay with that yeah and i think it fit the rest of the tone with uh with the addition of uh sam elliott here and it felt like this this movie had a lot of tones of western like the music and everything so i thought i think that made a lot of sense mm-hmm the idea of the elemental villains was because Johnson didn't want Johnny Blaze to run from the cops during the movie. Again, Can't fight the cops, really. He'd be killing them by accident. Again, has to be kid-friendly. Can't have him running for the cops. Very true. And by the way, he does that stare when he points at you like Elvis or like <laughs> Hulk Hogan. <laughs> yeah, and he says, innocent. But I don't know. That's what I'm saying. Depending on who's chasing him, that opens up a whole other thing there. <laughs> yeah yeah so uh, Ghost Rider's fire color represents his, his emotions orange fire means he is angry and blue fire means he is sad and again visually Ghost Rider looks very good when uh, it does. when it when it changes from the blue fire at several points in the movie I think it looked really really cool yeah I agree with that and you know what? I don't know the number of minutes total that we actually saw Ghost Rider on screen, but I would submit it's probably not enough. Yeah, I would say so. But I would I would assume that that's probably because it cost a lot. <laughs> uh, well, that's fair. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's fair. For Blackheart's first appearance, it was originally a push to the desert to a tree where some crows were falling dead to the ground and Blackheart's foot stomped into the ground. It was changed to raining fire with a thunderstorm. I think either one would have been effective. Gressel was originally the last character to be killed off, but to prevent confusion with Sandman from Spider-Man 3, he was killed off earlier in the movie. So, there you go. But to be honest, that Sandman character should never have been in Spider-Man 3. Well, at least not with the twisted origin they gave him. Uh, Yeah, twisted origin didn't work, but boy, there are so many great things. Like, the early fight that he has with Sandman is very cool. Also, uh, when Sandman wakes up and he's trying to pick up his ring, one of the coolest things I've ever seen in a comic book movie. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the best use of CGI, at least in a comic book. Peter Fonda wore 24 karat gold flakes in his hair and skin, so Mephisto is like the golden child. I don't even know what to make of that line. Like the Eddie Murphy movie? Hmm. That's It's capitalized golden child. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I, yeah, that's odd to me, but okay. Now that I think about it, yeah, he does have like a very Sodom New Sea look to him. Yeah. <laughs> I've never made that connection, but now that I think about it, yeah, he does look very similar to that character. Yeah, not bad. Mark Steven Johnson got drunk during filming the graveyard scene with Nick Cage, and they encountered the security guard who is a film fan and thought he saw a ghost. The guard offered him a cappuccino. Again, where does this come from? Like, what? Where did, all right. That boy, that set had to be a blast. Like, that, that sounds very funny. It does sound like it was fun to be on the set. Another example being on set in between takes with scenes featuring Mendez, the filmmakers would sit nearby drinking Red Bulls and listen to their iPods. And Eva brought hers in, and people sang along to her song from her iPod. And apparently, they always had a fun time when she was on the set. So she enjoyed herself. That's a good thing. You know, we've done movies that don't always have great stories coming out of them. Yes. So it's good that we had this. All right. Let's talk about the hell cycle. This is in, in the chopper in the movie is called Grace. Okay. That his dad gives him the hell cycle. 
is inspired by H.R. Geiger's art style, which I can completely see that now. Don't know mm-hmm. if I ever knew that. So they wanted to make it different from the comics. Is it too different? Is it a little too outlandish? Does it work? What do you think? I thought the cycle looked great. Hmm. Uh, it it's a bit too shiny, and I think that they tried to go too much in this in the other direction with the second movie, where they tried to give everything this like grime and like this um, dark look. Um, I think there's a balance. Uh, that's kind of my only issue with it, as it's a, a little bit too shiny. They go very heavy with the chrome on it, mm-hmm. but I like the look of it a lot. I like the actual design of it a lot. Yeah, I like it. I'm not crazy about it because I, you know, in, in my head, Phil, it's I, it's not the bike in the in the books. And I guess I just I don't think I had yet conditioned myself to. Rem- hey, Tom, remember this is not the comic book. This is an adaptation of the comic book. I don't know if I was quite there yet in my head. Mm-hmm. So, I I think it works because like when we think of like the uh the eighties Batman movie and just how like the Batmobile is so iconic and it's almost like its own um character and aspect in that movie. And I thought mm-hmm. the cycle fit because it's so over the top and it fits like Ghost Rider's introduction to the movie universe. Mm-hmm. Like it, it just wouldn't. I don't. I think you could have just gone with a motorcycle that's flaming, but just the fact that it's just this super over the top, souped up bike. Mm-hmm. I think there was something about it that made that cool. It's very obviously not of this earth. That's what it feels like. Yes, that's fine. Yeah, it, it should be noted here. This film wasn't finished until three or four weeks before release. Yeah. I don't know how often that gets mentioned for these big, big time Hollywood productions, but to me, that's cutting it very close. You know, I think one of the things that led us here, we talked about the original director of the first blade, which is uh, Stephen Norrington. And he was the first choice to direct this film. And I got to tell you, man, I think we would have gotten a, a ghost rider movie that I don't think we would have ever forgotten. And I don't want to say that it would have been leaps and bounds better than this, but I do believe it would have had a much edgier tone and not quite as comical in parts. I mean, dude, I think the movie would have been excellent had that guy directed it. Yeah. I think if you would have gotten like Goyer and I think you got that director, it's definitely a a, a totally different movie. Yeah, I agree with that. So uh, let's talk about the money it made. And I, the way we open this up, I kind of led folks to believe that maybe the money wasn't great, but let's elaborate here. The film earned fifty-two over fifty-two million over the four-day President's Day weekend, with a per theater average in the U.S. of around fourteen grand. In about thirty-six hundred theaters, it made it the highest President's Day opening weekend at the time, surpassing the three-day record held by Daredevil. Mm-hmm. Holy God, that's the bar you're setting. The film would uh, go on to hold these records until 2010 when Valentine's Day took them. And uh, so, yeah, evidently it was, you know, it was, uh, they were happy, I assume. On Rotten Tomatoes, this movie has an approval rating of 27%, which I kind of thought it would be higher than that. Audiences polled gave it a B, which I think I agree with a grade of B. I think that makes a lot of sense. Some of the critiques were Johnny Blaze is more funny than frightening. I agree with that but you hired Nick Cage. I don't know what you thought you were going to get. The sequel. We may as well cover it here because we're not, I don't, you know. But the sequel was released in 2012. As we know, Cage came back. It was a different director, different writer, director team on board. The film received worse reviews than this one, but was still a financial success. I guess people just wanted to see what it was based on the fact that it's him, based on the fact that it's part two. And, uh, you know, you spoke about the uh, the Robbie Rise version in the MCU that happened on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I thought he looked really good, too, by the way. I thought that really did work. I was kind of surprised they didn't go forward with that. Yeah, uh, I think at some point there was plans to do a spinoff with him, and it just didn't happen. I think at the time that was going to be one of those um, Hulu shows, I believe. Ah, I think you're right. I think it was going to be one of the Hulu shows, but then once the Hulu stuff got shuttered, it just never happened. Yeah. 
let's talk about the plot here real quick because we haven't we've only barely talked about it. this this idea phil of like there's this there's this list there's this scroll it's got you know a thousand was it what they said a thousand names on it and this guy black hearts out to get it and uh th- there are moments when i'm like why can't you just do something because like Mephisto has a confrontation with Blackheart and they say they're and Mephisto gets, I guess, I guess angry and he just poofs away. I'm like, why don't you just stop your son? What's preventing you from stopping him from doing this? So like there's moments in there that kind of fall apart for me where characters won't just go do stuff. They'll just talk and then one of them will just go away. I'm like, all right, that didn't make any sense. But what do you think about the plot here? Yeah, the plot is uh not great. Uh it uh to, it, like it's there's there's bits of it that falls apart right away, like, all right, well like you said, why doesn't Mephisto just step in? I guess I guess you're he can make the argument, oh, he doesn't want to step in, but because uh, reasons <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. So here's the plot. Let's boil this down. The demon Mephisto sends his bounty hunter, the ghost rider. To retrieve the contract of San Vaganza for control of a thousand dark souls. Seeing that the agreement would give Mephisto the power to bring hell on earth, the rider refuses and escapes with it. In 1986, Mephisto reaches out to a 17 year old Johnny Blaze, offering to cure his father's cancer in exchange for Johnny's soul. The next morning, Johnny awakens to discover the cancer cured, but his father dies later from burns sustained in a stunt accident. Johnny accuses Mephisto of causing his father's death, but Mephisto considers his side of the conflict contract fulfilled and promises to see Johnny again. And then it ends up, of course, as we know, Blackheart comes calling and he's got like, he's kind of like the blade of this movie. He's got the devil's powers, but not his weaknesses. He can come and go as he pleases. You know, the penance stare doesn't work on him until he's got, he absorbs the souls, of course, then it works on him. But like, yeah, when you really start breaking this down, Phil, it kind of falls apart, man, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't, uh, I don't know. Parts of this very much don't work. <laughs> but it's a, it's a fun movie for what it is. But yeah, sure. when, you, when you think about like, what is the bad guy's plot and what, uh, what Johnny Blaze is actually sent to do, it's like, uh, okay, that works i guess <laughs> and by the way at the end when the devil the devil when mephisto is offering to let him out of this wasn't he just a little bit too nice about it you can just have your old life back don't worry about it it's good like yeah deal hey hey phil a deal's a deal after all and i'm like you're a demon what are you talking about a deal's a deal like i don't yeah. know uh that felt again, weird very kid friendly again because look man, this is this is a devil that would actually let you out of the deal no it's not a thing. It's not a thing. Yeah, yeah it's the reason not a why thing. I deal with the devil is seen as what it is, and no, I don't think even if he would have, even if he did what he asked him, I just can't see Mephisto letting him out of deal. I mean, dude, he and her love each other so much, but then he tells this guy in front of her, "Yeah, I'm not giving it back. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Every time you mess up, I'm gonna be there and I'm gonna do stuff and." Oh, you'll be sorry. Yeah. And I'm uh, like, if if I'm her, I'm like, excuse me, what? I thought we were, are we not? Okay. Yeah. Again, they're trying to play up. He's, uh, he's, he's Toby Spider-Man and she is, uh, Mary Jane here. If he's, he's taking on this, uh, this power because it's his responsibility now. Mm. And I don't know how well that works here. Uh, I think the way they get to that isn't bad, but when, you think about it long enough, it's like, well, wait a minute. You agonized over this thing all movie, and he was just going to let you out of the deal, and you just go, nah, nah, I think I just want to be a superhero now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I want to have an insanely dangerous lifestyle and a world in which I could accidentally kill somebody not mean to and yeah, more power than I can wield. This will be fine. This is fine. But like you said, kid-friendly, they don't even mention that. Well, kids, there you got it. Um, there's that Ghost Rider movie. It's certainly not Blade 1, okay? But it sure ain't Blade Trinity either. So we'll call it somewhere in between. I I said, man, it's probably not even Blade 2. But it's watchable. It's not very offensive. 
There's Nick Cage in a cowboy hat eating jelly beans in the back of a tour bus. I don't know what more you people want. I mean, it's Jesus that we gave you that. We just gave you that. I don't know. I don't know what more could you want. Do you think that there's a world in which, and I know the MCU is doing what the MCU is doing right now. It's fairly quiet and been quiet for a little while because they're, they're busy with these, you know, the Captain America movie will be coming out. They're doing other things. And, you know, we're going to see how this all starts to take shape with RDJ coming back as doom. You know, is there a world in which we see cage back as an older Johnny blaze and passing the torch? No pun intended. And sort of rebooting and doing like a Danny Ketch Ghost Rider or Ronnie Ray's for that matter. Do we think that's going to happen? I don't think we need to see it. I think you could just reboot the property. I don't know if we need to see Nick Cage again. Hmm, Interesting. So you wouldn't be here for that? I I, I would be against it, but I think for me, I think you should just reboot it altogether. Hmm. I know right now with like, that's kind of the, the lane to, uh, acknowledge all of these older characters because uh you know we've gotten deadpool and wolverine we've gotten no way home and the multiverse opens up the opportunities to bring these actors back but i don't know that we need to do that with everything oh well that's fair but i still like to see it (laughs) (laughs) i mean i wouldn't be against it at all sure by the way that's robbie race I, i misspoke on that i wonder what he's doing now that actor I think he was very much on board with that. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> and, you know, at this point, Phil, would it even matter to fans? Like, would they still go back to that point and, and pull from that? I, I just wonder about that. Curious about it. I don't know. It's a good question. Maybe, like you said, if, if a reboot happens, it would just be a flat-out reboot from the ground up. I think that'd be fine. I just, you know, in this day and age when Cage is kind of hot again, I just don't know if they could do it without at least... Uh, including him in maybe not a major part of the film, but something. But you know, Phil, we've got the out. We've got the get out of jail free car with the multiverse where you can do whatever you want. It doesn't matter because it's a different person anyway. Yeah, sure. Well, kids, there you have it. There's uh, there's Ghost Rider. There's your Halloween flick, your Halloween episode for this year. Enjoy that one. Hopefully you did. And uh, more to come on that for sure. Phil, before we go, let us get your last word on Ghost Rider. Uh, I would, I would assume that this movie is uh, a lot of guilty pl- people's guilty pleasures, like my own. Um, I can definitely see people not liking this movie and it not being for you. But if you go into it not taking it very seriously and you just want to see uh, Ghost Rider's introduction as a movie character, I think it's a lot of fun. Um, does it have a lot of issues? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, <laughs> absolutely uh but it's again i also have a lot of fun with this movie when i do watch it yeah that's fair it it's got issues some of the stuff in here is you know a little too quirky and you know there's moments when again they make choices and you're like i don't understand why they're doing that that doesn't make a lot of sense again it's just it's just one of those films but i think there's more fun to it than there's than there is not fun to it so, uh, yeah, again, it's no Blade Trinity, I'll tell you. That's for sure. Well, folks, there you got it. And um, be on the lookout for what's ahead. I know what we're going to do next, and it should be a, should be a fun fun thing to tackle. We'll be back to comedy. Uh, not that this didn't have some comedy, but it won't be action-adventure comic book stuff. It'll be on to a comedy for the next episode. So stay tuned for that. And uh, feel free to check out the archive to get the rest of our Marvel stuff. We continue to cover Marvel, of course. It's one of the M's in this podcast. So as long as they're making it, we're going to cover it. That's how we roll. We'll get there and we get there. But for now, that is Ghost Rider. Hey, thanks for listening to the show. Check out our social media on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at 6 Podcast. We'll see you next time.